Give me the sign when you're on, would you? We're on. All right. My name is George Gordon. I teach constitutional law, courtroom strategy and procedure, and pro se litigation. I'm a attorney. I'm not an ordinary attorney. An attorney is normally called an attorney at law. I'm an attorney in fact, which is called a pro se attorney or a pro se litigant. <clears throat> I can litigate for myself, but I can't go out and litigate for you. So what I do is I teach courtroom strategy and procedure. I teach law. I'm self-taught, but then don't be too shocked. Even Jesus Christ was self-taught, and the scribes asked him where he got his letters. He hadn't been to seminary, and here he was out teaching. Same thing was true with Elijah and Jeremiah. If you ask them, what seminary did you graduate from, I think they'd have to tell you, I haven't been to seminary. In fact, one of the classes I teach is pretty surprising when it comes to this thing of law. Some of the top jurists in the United States, such as uh, John Jay and uh, four Supreme Court Chief Justices have never been to law school. Perhaps you've never heard that before. William Wirt was the Attorney General of the United States, and he'd never attended law school. In fact, the concept of law school is fairly recent. It's come in the last hundred years. I'm located in Isabella, Missouri. I'm on the north shore of Lake Bull Shoals, so if you want to write to me or if you want to come to school, we're located at Post Office Box 297 in Isabella, Missouri, and the zip code is 65676, and my phone number is 417-273-4967. If you want to catch that again, it's 417-273-4967. Now today is called a seminar. I have put on videotape and audio tape many hundreds of hours of material. My basic school is 120 hours. And then I have three other schools, the ultimate law, the rest of the story, and the penalties, which deal with the thing called the common law. Where does law originate? What's the basis of law? And why does it impact or affect you? Why are you affected and impacted by the laws of Colorado or the United States or Canada or the United Nations or somebody else? What brought that power upon you? Well, there's a logical and systematic answer, and so I'm going to answer that question for you today and show you where the origin of law uh, comes from or what the origin of law is and why it impacts upon you and how it works. Some of you will be surprised. Some of you will be angered. <clears throat> but then don't get mad at me. I'm just the messenger. I'm the guy that comes along and says, this is the way the law works. Here's the way the system has been set up. If you're dissatisfied with it, you'll have to go to the lawmaker and have it changed. So as I tell people very systematically, I don't make any laws and I don't make any rules. So don't get mad at me if the rules of procedure are something that you're upset with and don't get angry with me if the laws of Colorado or some other entity, jurisdiction, are uh, disagreeable to you because I don't have any impact upon them. However, I don't practice most of the law of the United States. I don't practice the law of Colorado. I don't have a driver's license or a social security number, a marriage license, a birth certificate. I'm not impacted by the social impact statutes of Colorado or Missouri or someplace else. And as libertarians will constantly say, what we need is less government. And we want to follow the principle that he who is governed best is governed least. And I think I'm governed just about the least of anybody in this room, perhaps even in the United States, but that doesn't mean that I'm not governed. I am not an anarchist. I don't advocate tax protest. I'm not a right-wing extremist. I don't even vote. I don't know why people call me some of these terms like uh, anarchist, tax protester, or a right-wing extremist because I don't vote. I can't hold public office. I'm not even a citizen of the United States. I don't see why anybody would get upset with me because I don't pay the, the income tax in the United States. After all, you people here don't pay the income tax in France or Germany or Argentina, and nobody seems to be too upset with you because you don't pay your taxes there. So why would you be upset with me because I don't pay my taxes here? Oftentimes I hear this in a rhetorical manner. They'll say, well, why don't you go to Russia? And I'm sitting here saying, well, why in the world would I want to go to Russia? Why, why wouldn't I go to Greece or West Germany or Argentina or someplace else? 
I was born in the United States. My nationality is here. I have a claim to the land here. I have a common law right to it. And the only distinction between you and me is that I don't have citizenship, which is a political franchise. And I'm going to show you what that political franchise is, and let's see whether or not you want to maintain that political franchise. Now, there's a little introduction as to who and what I am and what I do. Now, let's take a look at the basis of law. I'm going to go to the board, and I'm going to show you something about the law that perhaps you've never been told before. It's my contention that every seventh grader should be started with the basis of law and probably international law, and then we'll come down to the laws of your country and then the laws of your state so that you can better understand what the requirements are of your citizenship if, in fact, you want to be a citizen of Colorado. But they don't do that. They do send you to the public schools, and they do tell you something about government, but they don't teach you about the law. They teach you civics and government. They teach you how to vote, teach you how to register, fill out a checking account, fill out a check. They'll tell you some of the, the more salient points of uh, citizenship, but they don't teach you about the law and the requirements under the law. And there's an important reason for that. If at any time you people understood the law, you probably would use the law to expatriate yourself from your government so that you were no longer subject to its dictates and its terms and conditions. Now, law is divided into two forms, and it's been this way as long as mankind has been on the planet. There are two forms of law. Let's take a look at what they are. What we practice today is called the civil law. The only other form is called the common law. The common law is very ancient and started approximately in 1487 B.C. A fellow by the name of Moses brought this law down off the mountain at Mount Sinai. This law here is very ancient also. It has its roots in the law of Hammurabi. This is called Hammurabi's Code, and it's got its start at approximately the Tower of Babel, and depending upon who you want to listen to, around 2000 B.C. Now, while this law was codified in its present form in 1487 B.C., the law of Moses was existent long before that. It got its start over here at the Garden of Eden. Uh, Usher tells us that's around 4004 B.C. You know, give or take 20 years or so, it's not that important. So the more ancient of the two laws is the common law, and the common law has gone through a number of transformations through the ages. Now, I'm not going to document all of my positions today. I want to point out that in many of my tutoring classes, this is book one of the, of the tax class, in which I'll document and show you the historical documentation for my statements, but obviously in a seminar, I simply don't have the time to sit here and make the citations and give you the bibliography, although in my classes, I'll give you the complete bibliography and show you how this can be documented. Now, when a fellow by the name of Samuel, about 1100 B.C., was the last judge in Israel, and you'll read about this in 1 Samuel 8. The people came to him and they said, listen, Sam, we've had it with you and we've had it with this government and with this law. We're tired of it, and what we want is a king like all the nations around us. This is very reminiscent of what Paul Warburg was telling us in 1909 when he came over here from the Rothschilds in, uh, in England, and uh, the Rothschilds are based in Germany, but the Bank of England is the Rothschild Bank. And, I think Paul Warburg was the front man. He came over to the United States. He says, what you people need here in the United States is a central bank like all the nations of Europe, which is exactly what happened here in this uh, history of the common law. They came to Samuel and said, we want a king. Now, under this law, the Mosaic law, these people had no Congress. They had no city councils or mayors. They had no policemen. They had a different system of government and administration. It doesn't, doesn't mean that they didn't have a law. They had a complete law. There are 759 statutes, judgments, and commandments in the law. 
<clears throat> but they didn't have any policemen to enforce or to administer the law. And they didn't have any Congress sitting over here to enact some new round of legislation, some new tariff or treaties or sales tax or income tax or anything else. They had a tax called a tithe, and it supported the Levitical priesthood. And the Levites conducted the postal service and the, and the civil service. But this was a unique form of law. But for whatever reason, the people said, we don't want it. And so the Creator said, well, don't let me get in your way. So he told Samuel, you go over and tell these people now when they change their law, they're going to change their God at the same time. And the people said, well, we're not going to hear of that and we're going to have a king. So he said, all right, we'll give you a king. We'll give you some champion, some guy that's six foot 19 and rides a big white horse, some guy you can look up to and ride around in parades and throw ticker tape around, and go to war and have all these, these great glories and honors. And so they changed their law. Well, when they changed their law, they created a monarch. And as an operation of law, the monarch is the sovereign. The monarch is the lawmaker. Now, anytime you have a monarch or a lawmaker, you have the makings here of a dictator. Some kings are good, and some kings are bad, and some are mediocre. Now, when you go to England, you're looking at a monarchial form of government over there in which there's only one sovereign, and her name is Elizabeth. Everybody else there is a subject. Everybody else in England is a citizen, a chattel property of the monarch. So you only had an opportunity to be the chattel property of the creator God or the chattel property over here of the king. Now from these monarchs over here, we've had a plethora of evolutionary process in the governmental apparatus. Now the people come along one day and they said, well listen, this king over here he goes from generation to generation, and sometimes the son of the king is a bad guy. So in the United States, we've evolved a new concept. We're going to elect our king. So we have what we call a president. But it doesn't make any difference what you call him. The fellow sits in the seat of power, and he makes law. So we have a lawmaking forum over here. We have a king called President Bush, and he proposes the law, and we go to the representatives and the representatives who are our guardians and go into the halls of Congress and they enact legislation. If you've ever had a part in the legislative process, you know that legislation is not enacted or is it created nor is it suggested by the people. It is suggested by the insurance companies, the banks, and the institutions who also put up the money to elect the politicians, that is, the lawmakers. And you have nothing to say about it one way or the other. And if you think that's untrue, take a look at your seatbelt law or your compulsory insurance law and then ask yourself how many of you people went to your lawmaker and said, what we need in the state of Colorado is a seatbelt law. How many of you did that? Oh, you didn't. You do have a seatbelt law here, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I know, because we had one up in Idaho. So I can tell you from personal experience, I worked in the legislature for six years. And when the seatbelt law came up in Idaho to show you how your system works over here, in case you thought that you had some input into the lawmaking process, which you don't, and I said, well, this is the way America works. This is America, the land of the free, the home of the brave. You know, I've been to the public school system, and I know how law is made because I went to the 10th grade, and I read the book. So I said, well, I'm going to go to the legislature, and by God, I'm going to make some changes up here. So I went into the committee hearing, and over a period of years, I made a lot of friends, you know, in the legislature. I walked into the uh, <clears throat> House Committee on Transportation, and there were three guys in there from the insurance industry. And these three guys had tremendous, I mean, they had equipment. I mean, they had slides, projections. They had three-color three bar graphs to show how safe and how wonderful and how great and tremendous seat belts were. And I'll, I'll concede this, I think seat belts are absolutely everything that they've been set out to be. You probably would be a fool to drive down the street in your car without wearing your seat belt. But it begs the question, <laughs> what if you don't want to wear your seat belt? Who makes the final determination for you as to whether you're going to wear a seat belt or not? I thought you ought to make that determination. 
But the legislature in Idaho said, no, we're not going to leave it to you to decide whether or not you wear your seatbelt. We're going to decide for you that you're going to wear your seatbelt, and if you don't, we're going to punish you. So I brought 104 witnesses in, and there was only three witnesses for the seatbelt law when it was passed in Idaho. Three. Three witnesses. All three of them were lobbyists for the insurance industry. They had a hell of a presentation. I brought in 104 witnesses. I had at least two witnesses from every one of the 44 counties in Idaho to testify. After the first five witnesses, the chairman said, are all of these witnesses, Mr. Gunner Gordon, going to testify to essentially the same thing? I said, yes. He said, thank you. Now, there's nine members on the committee. And when it was reported out of committee, it was seven to two for the seatbelt law. Got that? Seven to two. When it passed the House, it was 27 to five with one abstention. Now, let me tell you, when the people of Idaho walked into the legislature and said, I'm Joe Sixpack, and I don't want a seatbelt law, <clears throat> the committee said, seven to two, and we don't care what you want, you're going to have a seatbelt law. And then I went to some of the committee uh, <clears throat> seats, you know, some of the committeemen over here, and I said, Bill, why did you vote for that? And he said, well, because the Republican cau <clears throat> caucus told us that that's the way we had to vote today. So when you go in to vote, if you're a representative or a senator, you don't determine how you want to vote, because if you, if you heard the word maverick used with some representative, now, a maverick doesn't get, very, get along very well in the legislature. Let me show you what happened. It's divided into two groups, Republicans and Democrats. <coughs> now, you've got a Democratic governor. His name is Evans, and he wants the seatbelt law. Why does he want the seatbelt law? I don't know if he gets a kickback. I wouldn't say that that's true. But the insurance lobby comes in, and the insurance company wants a seatbelt law because they have to pay the insurance claims. And if everybody wore a seat belt, then they would have less demand at the claims window of the insurance industry. They want your premium, but they don't want you to get hurt. So we need a seat belt law. It's for the health, safety, and welfare of the people and comes under Health, Safety, and Welfare Title 16 of the Idaho Code. That's why we're going to have this. Now, the people are sitting around out here saying, well, I pay my insurance premium, so if I get, if I get hurt, pay me. It's a contract. And the insurance industry says, well, that's true, but we don't want to pay you. We want to collect the premium, but we don't want to pay you. So the insurance industry lobbies the various senators and, and legislators for a seatbelt law. And the various senators and representatives will vote for the seatbelt law because that's where the money and the power is. See, you people, how many of you have ever given money to a Senate or a representative, a candidate for office? How did you give the money? You sent it to his campaign office over here. 20 bucks? Well, let me tell you where the money comes from. You see, Mutual of Omaha can't write a check for $300,000 and give it to Senator Church. Say, that's against the law. So what they do is they make an incentive program for all of the insurance agents that sell Mutual of Omaha. Then the insurance agent goes up here and he gives the money to Senator Frank Church and he gives $500 or $1,000, whatever the maximum is, plus whatever perks the company passes along. So if the company likes Senator Church, they pass the perks along to all of their brokers and their agents in Idaho. The brokers and the agents pass that on to Frank Church and Frank Church is mysteriously elected because he's the guy that can put more dollars on radio and television and billboards than anybody else. And it's a popular public opinion program is the way you elect a senator or representative. We tested this in Idaho. I can buy any representative seat in the state of Idaho for $10,000. That's all I need to elect a representative. To get a state senate seat, I need about 30000 And if you want the senate seat, like Church's seat or somebody or McClure's seat up there, it requires at least a million dollars today. Why in the hell would anybody spend a million dollars to buy a seat that only pays you $60,000 a year? Now, let's grow up and be intelligent. You don't spend a million dollars on a $60,000 a year job. 
So there had to be something else behind it beside the 60,000 bucks, isn't there? All right, getting back here to this thing then of law, it's divided into two <coughs> basic forms. Everybody practices this form of law. That's the only form of law you know. It's the only form that's taught in your public schools. And the common law not only isn't taught, it has been abolished in the United States. And it was abolished by Congress in 1968 in the Rules of Procedure as a matter of law. In Idaho, the common law was abolished by statute. Now, there are some common law states. And it doesn't mean that you can't practice the common law. It just means that the United States of America and your state, Colorado, are not common law states. And you don't have state citizenship. What you have is state residency. And if you'll look up the word resident, you'll find that it's a foreigner and an alien. And remember, always look up legal terms in a legal dictionary. And you've got to watch out for this term of definitions because the word religion as a definition means a ceremony or an organized ceremony. That's the definition of it. But that's not the origin, and it's not the meaning. <clears throat> the origin is where you break the word down. Re, as I showed you yesterday, <clears throat> is to do over. Like remodel. I'm going to model, and then I'm going to remodel. Remember. I'm going to member, and then I'm going to remember. I'm going to do something over again. Lidge is Latin for lie. So re is to do over, lidge is a lie, and ION means to do it among us. Religion is a reiterated lie among us. So as I pointed out to you yesterday, that's why a preacher has to be licensed. It's against the law of lie. So he has to have a license to reiterate a lie among us, such as Christmas. Everybody knows Christmas is not the birthday of the Messiah. And so every year you practice Christmas, which is a reiterated lie among us every year. All right, so now you know. All right, so the common law then <clears throat> is a form of law that came to us from some place. Now let's take a look at where did it come from. Well, the common law was abolished with Samuel. But they didn't abolish the law per se, they just abolished the practice of the law in their political organization, just like we've done today. The common law isn't abolished, you can go practice it. It's just that the state of Colorado won't practice it, nor will they recognize you if you practice it. For instance, a common law marriage. You go out here and you say to your girl, <clears throat> your girlfriend, let's get married, and she says, well, yes, let's get married, and well, now what are we going to do? Well, let's consummate the marriage with penetration, which is what marriage is. It's an agreement with penetration. And penetration, then, is the consummation of the marriage. Wait a minute. If you look up the definition of the word consummate, it means to bind up or to do away with, to terminate, to cancel. But isn't that the beginning of the marriage? I mean, isn't this the honeymoon? See, we don't pay attention to the definitions and the meanings of words. To consummate the marriage means to consummate the contract. It comes from the old common law in which we were dealing with patriarchal marriage. That is, the marriage in a patriarchal family isn't a contract between the boy and the girl, who are the parties to the marriage. It's a contract between the principal, which is the father of the bride and the bridegroom. And so when the marriage took place, the contract was terminated, which meant to consummate the marriage. The marriage is the agreement of the principles that a marriage will take place. When the marriage finally takes place, the contract is fulfilled, isn't it? The marriage begins with the consummation of the marriage contract, which was a contract between the principles, not the parties. But see, we don't do that anymore, do we? See, the boy goes out and proposes to the girl, and they run off on a Hollywood-type marriage escapade, and they eliminate the family from the marriage. Now, in order for them to do that, it was a violation of the common law because the woman had no capacity to enter into the contract, and so now we have to have a methodology for her to break the law, so we create what's called a license. 
which is permission to do something that's illegal, unlawful, a tort, or a trespass. So it's the civil law state that gave you ladies capacity. You never got it here from the common law because the common law never gave you any capacity. Now, in case you thought that the state was your best friend, you want to take a look at this concept of the guardian ward relationship as it relates to children because you know typically when you ladies have a baby you say well this is my baby this is my child but it isn't <clears throat> and neither the civil nor the common law will give you ladies the capacity to own your children either your husband's going to own the child or the state's going to own the child but you're never going to own the child and there isn't any country in the world that will give you that capacity in some countries, it's worse than others. But, you know, there's the way the game is played. Now, beginning back here with 1 Samuel 8, about 1100 BC, the next time we see the common law come into fruition is about 500 BC with a guy named Malmudius. And this law was passed on down from generation to generation until about, I think it was 872 uh, AD with a guy named uh, Alfred the Great is where Alfred comes in. And then about 1215, you remember the famous Magna Carta. <clears throat> Magna Carta came into play. And remember here again, it wasn't the people who came out and claimed their rights, it was the noblemen who came out and claimed their rights. They said, we're English freemen, and we've got rights over here, and the king was interfering with their rights. Where'd they get these rights? Well, these rights came from Exodus. I'll just write this down here for you. Exodus 19, 16 through 24, 8. And this is called the Old Covenant. This old covenant over here was codified by Alfred the Great in 872 AD, and this is the basis of Anglo-Saxon administration. It's the basis of Anglo-Saxon administration in 1990. Now the distinction that has occurred between civil and common law is, is the common law works under contract directly, the, excuse me, the civil law works under contract directly with your consent, and there has to be a document over here. So when you get a driver's license, You've got an application to an adhesion contract in which you sign on the application and you bind yourself to Title 49 of the Idaho Code, which is the traffic code of Idaho. And you do that directly. Now, the common law is also controlled by contract, but the contract is an adhesion contract in which you never signed or agreed to anything. And it was binding upon you under what's called the inheritance law. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. From 1215, this law was moved forward in 1538 by Henry VIII. Henry VIII added what we call equity to the law. And there were some good reasons for it, mainly political, but basically Henry VIII said, we're going to add an equitable concept to the common law. And then Queen Anne in 1630... And then it came to our country in 1776 with the Declaration and in 1787 with the Constitution. I won't belabor the subject, but let's take a look at uh, Article 1, Section 10, where the clause says, No state shall make anything but gold or silver coin a tender and payment of debt is an extrapolation from Leviticus 19, 35 and 36, which says you shall not have an unjust weight or balance in your bag. And as you go through the Constitution, you will find that there are probably 25 or 30 of these principles of law, especially in the Bill of Rights, which come from the Old Covenant of Moses. In other words, the basis of Anglo-Saxon administration comes from the Law of Moses. We call it the Law of England, or the English Common Law, and it was Lord Blackstone in 1757 who published Blackstone's Commentaries, 
and set out the basis of the English common law. It was as it was used in English uh, in England and in the United States. It was Kent's commentaries that extrapolate Blackstone's commentaries for use in the United States. Now, this probably is new to most of you, and you never heard this concept of law before, but then this is the basis of what we call Anglo-Saxon administration. You were born here in the United States. You never subscribed to this law. You didn't go to the legislature and tell them, this is what I want to practice. This is the way I want the law codified. You were born into a ready-made society, and this is the way the law was already set up. So if you're looking at the law of real estate and adverse possession, the concept of adverse possession comes from the law of Moses pursuant to the land law that says, you shall not remove your neighbor's landmark. Because at the common law, there's no such thing as absentee ownership. Because at the common law, there's no such thing as ownership of land. And that's because there's a collateral estoppel to owning land in Leviticus 25:23 that says the land shall not be sold forever because the land is mine. So somebody by the name of God, as we commonly call them, under the common law, the law of Moses says the land shall not be bought or sold forever because I own it. It's mine. The earth is my footstool and you can't have it. So the civil law comes along and says, well, how are we going to make profit and gain off of a commodity that everybody wants unless we can buy it and sell it? So we've got to have real estate law, don't we? You see why you have to license a real estate broker? It's against the law to sell land. So you have to license the broker to commit an act which is otherwise a tort or a trespass. So the concept of adverse possession is simply, if you're not the owner in possession, then I'm going to come along and adversely possess it and become the new title holder. Take a look at an automobile title when you go home tonight. Who owns your automobiles? Anybody in here know? State. State owns your automobile. Take a look at the word title. Title isn't ownership. <clears throat> and you don't have the title. You have a certificate of title. Take a look at it. They're not lying to you. It says right at the top, certificate of title. It tells you there's a title holder someplace. You, went, you made the assumption that you were the title holder. <coughs> because you're holding a piece of paper that says certificate of title. <coughs> you're not the owner, and you're not the title holder. But you've got a piece of paper that tells you that there is a creature like that someplace, but you don't know where, because nobody's explained it to you. Same thing is true with an abstract on land. You're sitting on the land, but you pay a property tax, and the property tax is the prima facie evidence that you're paying rent to somebody. If you're paying rent to somebody, then it's the prima facie evidence that you don't own it. Now, you may not know who owns it, but you ought to know who doesn't own it the next time you pay your property tax. And that's just the way the law works. All right, with that little bit of basis over here, now let's take a look at the concept of law itself. Law is really a very cut and dried, black and white concept. It's been told to me over the years that the law is really gray. Can't know what it is. Well, that's not true. That's what's been sold to us, but that isn't quite correct. It's good for business to tell you that the law is gray, and of course, if the law is gray, then your conduct can be excused, and you can do some things that you might think or that might actually be illegal or unlawful, but you can justify it by saying, well, I really didn't know. And there's an old concept that says ignorance of the law is no excuse, but that's a misnomer. Ignorance of the law is an affirmative defense. It may not be an excuse, but it's an affirmative defense because crime requires two elements. That is, you have to have intent to go along with the act. But you don't need any intent with a license. When you get a license, it's the prima facie evidence that you intended to break the law. That's why you went out and got the license. Otherwise, you wouldn't need one, would you? So if you were going to get a broker's license to sell real estate, don't you think you ought to ask the state this question? What law is it that I'm in the process of breaking or that I seek to break for which I need this license? I think the lady behind the counter looked at you like you were mork for mork because 
in our society, a license is a badge of honor. I remember when I first got my driver's license, it means that I've arrived. It means that I can reach the pedals and see over the steering wheel. <clears throat> but I never asked the question beyond why do I need this, and the lady told me you need this because <clears throat> we want to show that you're competent to drive, that is, your feet reach the pedals and you can see over the steering wheel. <clears throat> Let's take a look at civil again. The civil law works upon these four elements. First of all, you've got a constitution. The constitution then is supported by or construed by statute. The statute over here has to be enforced by a judgment. And then this judgment over here has to have a penalty. Now, you know that's about the way it works. The Constitution provides for driver's licenses. The statute enacts the driver's license code. And the judge tells you that you're driving without a license and invokes a penalty and tells you you've got to pay him a $100 fine. Well, the common law works the same way. The common law has four indice also in which one is the Ten Commandments, which is the basis of law. Now we're going to have a statute over here that says, Thou shalt not steal. But then how are you going to construe the statute without a judgment? And in Scripture, it's not called a penalty, it's called an ordinance. So an ordinance is the penalty that's enforced for a violation of a statute that violates one of the Ten Commandments. Now, when we take a look at the civil law, there's three elements that make it work. Contract, overtime, for profit. And in Eisner versus McComber, they added the term gain. So I'm going to use the word gain because that's what the Supreme Court told us. And this activity here under the civil law is called a privilege. It's a privilege to drive. Commerce is a privilege which is regulated and controlled under Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution. So you have a Constitution construed by statute, enforced by judgment, which has penalties based upon a contract over time for profit and gain and is a privilege. Now, the common law is predicated upon three elements, which is land, labor, and substance. And these are guaranteed as a matter of right, and they're called inalienable rights. And this is why the, the boys at Runnymede got a little upset. See, the civil law had uh, interfered with their rights of an Englishman, the rights of a free man. And so they took King John out there on the plains, and they said, let me tell you, or let us explain to you how this game is going to be played, or we're going we're gonna to select a new king. And John saw the point of their, their spears and their swords, and he said, by God, I think you boys are right. We need a little change here in the law. These rights over here, which are called inalienable rights, come from the Creator God. They don't come from the state. They've already been guaranteed you as a matter of birthright. And that's where the term birthright comes from. It's a right by birth. Now, you all know who the next king of England's going to be, don't you? Is there any doubt in anybody's mind as to how the election's going to come out? <laughs> Hell, we all knew Charlie was the next king in 1948, didn't we? We just didn't know when. We just knew who he's going to be. All right, now, once we got the basis of this concept of law down over here, <coughs> now you can see why it is that a lot of these tax protesters are a little bit in conflict with the law. Now, I'm not a Christian, and I'm not here to promote uh, religious philosophy one way or the other. I know that 95% of the people in this room are Christians, and I don't want to offend you, and I don't want you to think that I'm down on Christians or anything, or Muslims or Buddhists or anything else, but remember, I'm a, an instructor in law, and I'd be doing a disservice over here if I brought the Bible into the room as a basis of law 
And you'd all say, well, this guy must be a preacher. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not a preacher. I'm not even a Christian. I don't get involved in religion one way or the other. But remember, the Bible now, or the scriptures, is the basis of Anglo-Saxon administration. So how are we going to use the Bible on the courtroom floor? I do it very effectively. When I walk into court, <clears throat> I walk in as a Hebrew practicing the law of Moses because the judge asks me, why are you here driving without a driver's license? So I have to have an answer to the, for this fellow. He says, why don't you have any insurance? And the answer is, because it's against the law. And he says, well, that's preposterous. The law of Colorado, I think you do have this here, doesn't the law of Colorado require all you people to have driver's licenses, registration, and insurance? Yeah. I don't have those. Now, I'm driving around on your streets here. But I'm not in violation of any law. Now, you people in Colorado have a God here. You reach in your back pocket and pull out your driver's license, and it will identify who your sovereign, who your lawmaker is. And your signature on that license and on the application is the prima facie evidence that you have contracted with this sovereign lawmaker of Colorado and you agreed to obey all the laws, rules, statutes, and judgments of this sovereign entity called Colorado. Didn't you all do that? All right. Well then, don't you think you ought to fulfill and uphold the terms of your contracts? Don't you think you, if you said you would do something, you ought to do that? You ever heard that concept, concept that a man's word is his bond? Well, that comes from Numbers 30, verse 2. For a man's word is his bond. What proceeds out of your mouth shall not return again. But I've never made any contract with this God, this sovereign power of Colorado. I don't have any contract with him. I never agreed that I would, that I would obey any of his laws or statutes. Now you come along and you say, well, you have to agree. Why? Did you ever ask yourself that question? Why did you get a driver's license? <coughs> you went down and got a driver's license because somebody told you that something bad, wicked, terrible, awful, or evil was going to happen to you if you didn't do that. Didn't they? Did you ever test it to find out what kind of bad, wicked, terrible, awful, evil acts this this sovereign was going to do to you if you didn't obey him. Nobody ever tested it, did they? Right. What happened? Uh, they came right to you tickets all the time. Do they do bad things to you? Yeah. Lock you up in jail. <laughs> Lock you up in jail and do all these bad things. <coughs> they don't do that to me. Why? Something's different. So as I pointed out yesterday, let's take a look at what Colorado is. Colorado is a mental hospital. The reason it's a mental hospital is because the people here called citizens are incompetent. There's an operation of law. It's, excuse me, don't you have representatives over here in the legislature? Aren't those representatives elected by citizens? Can a non-citizen vote for a representative? What is a representative? Guardian. He's a guardian. You got it. Well, a guardian has a ward. A citizen is a ward or an incompetent. Now, you don't have to be mentally incompetent to have a guardian. All you have to do is to decide that you're incapable of managing your own political affairs. And since you're incapable of managing your own political affairs, you elect someone to go manage your political affairs for you. But I'm not incompetent. I can manage all of my own political affairs. And I don't need a representative. That's why I don't need this mental hospital called Colorado. So I'm going to practice a different law, a different <coughs> political regime, a different political methodology for accomplishing those things that I want accomplished in a political sphere. Colorado is organized as a corporation. In fact, Colorado is a municipal 
corporation, which is organized under a master holding company, called the USA Incorporated. And you have a governor, and this governor over here is the warden. And you have a legislature. This legislature is the board. It's the board of directors. And you have police, and these are the guards. This is the way you're organized here, and you're incapable of handling your political affairs, which means you people can't make political determinations. You need somebody else to do it for you. Should Colorado go to war over the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait? You people are unable to make that determination individually, so you have elected Pat Schroeder to represent you in Congress. And she's going to vote and make that determination for you because you're incapable. I've already made that determination. I already know the answer. So I don't need this. So I don't subscribe to it. Now somebody says to me, well, how did you accomplish that? It's called expatriation, and I'm not a citizen of the United States, and I'm not a resident of Colorado. I have the same status as an Englishman would have as he's driving through Colorado. You people, by the way, are you angry at tourists that come from Europe, travel through your state, spend money, they don't bother you? Do I bother you? Am I offensive? Thank you. I, sometimes when I do these, these seminars, people get offended. They say, why, you commie pinko bastard, why don't you go back to Russia where you belong? <laughs> Sitting here saying, do you say that to the French and the English and the <coughs> Germans that come over here and spend money? <coughs> Now, it may well be that I'm a political incompetent, but I'm not a Colorado political incompetent. <laughs> and I may be a black-ass nigger on a Mississippi plantation, but it ain't the Colorado plantation. Now, when we get into this thing called citizenship over here, everybody has to be a citizen of some place on planet Earth. Now, I didn't make that law, and I didn't come to that conclusion. It was the Supreme Court of the United States that said everybody is going to have citizenship someplace. Now, let's take a look at what citizenship is, because you see, this is where the citizens reside in these mental hospitals. Now, we call these states, but this mental hospital over here gives you a franchise, and they say, okay, we're going to let you sell real estate on this street corner. And, hey, you, we're going to let you be a barber over here. And hey, we're going to let you uh, operate these uh, seminars, these, this World Congress. We're going to give you this franchise right here, see? But you've got to cut us in. Aren't you going to cut the state into a little piece of the take? You got to pay, you pay your sales tax, do you? And, and your income tax? And <laughs> well, don't you think that it's right for a mental patient in a mental hospital to obey the words of his guardian, the guard? Where do you think the word guard came from? Guardian? I mean, help, man, just pay attention to the language. Nobody's lying to you. <laughs> governor? What's a governor? Isn't a governor a throttle? Doesn't the governor control a runaway machine? Well, ma'am, you'd run away with political power if you didn't have a governor over here to control you. He who is governed best is governed least, but the guy that's governed least has to govern himself. You know, if I couldn't govern myself, I would need a governor. But I can govern myself, so I don't need a governor to do it for me. And I don't need a guard, <laughs> because I don't need to be guard and I can guardian myself. Now, this legislature over here is what makes the rules. They make the laws for all of these citizens, these inmates. Well, if I subscribed to somebody else's law, then I wouldn't need your legislature to make law for me, would I? In other words, if you come from Missouri, you see, then you're in the Missouri mental hospital. And you people out here in Colorado are not subject to the laws of the Missouri mental hospital or the California Mental Hospital, or the Argentine Mental Hospital, and so on down the line. Now, I am subject 
to a mental hospital someplace else. But everybody has the capacity to make the determination as to what mental hospital he wants to associate with. And this is called immigration or immigration. You know, you have a right to immigrate and emigrate. That's I-M and E-M. So you can leave America and go to Argentina, or you can leave Argentina and come to America. People do that all the time. But everybody is going to be a citizen of one of these mental hospitals someplace on planet Earth. Now, I'm sorry to be the reporter of bad tidings because I know a lot of people would like to be anarchists, and they want to be a citizen of no country in the world. So do I. In other words, if you really wanted to know what George Gordon's ultimate motive is, it's just the same as everybody else's. I want to be totally free of all rules, government, and restraint. I want to be free to do whatever I want to do to anybody I want to do it to, to any time, with no penalties or punishments. If I feel like robbing a bank today, I want to rob the bank, and I want the teller to say, we're terribly sorry if we've been slow in giving you the money in your bag. If I walk out on the street and the bells are going off, I want the policeman to say, would you like to use my police cruiser in your getaway? And then can I be your driver? See, I don't want any repercussions. Now, that sounds kind of preposterous, but I think that's pretty much the way human nature is designed. In other words, we want the benefits from government, but we don't want to be constrained, do we? God, I'd like to have credit cards and checkbooks like everybody else, but I don't want to pay an income tax. Sounds kind of anarchical, doesn't it? Hey, listen, I want welfare, food stamps, aid to families with dependent children, public schools, but I don't want to pay for them, but I want you to pay for it, lady. Isn't that about what you're thinking? You want all those things, but you want me to pay for it. Well, that's pretty much the way humans are. In other words, they're ungovernable and they're uncontrollable, but we all recognize that if we run around in a system where we've got all Billy the kids, well, who's going to raise the potatoes? You know, if you don't have law and order, the guy that grows the potatoes suddenly finds out about harvest time that he's got a lot of harvesters that won't pay him for his potatoes. They just come and take them. And so over the years, we've all recognized that even though we don't like the government of God, we have to have some kind of government to throttle the bank robbers and the thieves and the rapists and the robbers and the pillagers. We have to have somebody. And so the system that we have evolved over here is the highway patrolman and the policeman and the governor and the mayor and the city council. Well, now we've been trying this for quite a few years, haven't we? How many of you like it? Well, I woke up one day when an OSHA inspector walked into my factory. I didn't know there was a problem in the world up through 1976. I was one of Tricky Dick's silent majority, paying my taxes and doing my thing. I'd been educated in the public school system, and they told me how everything is supposed to work, and I went out. I was a general contractor, plumbing contractor, a boiler and heater contractor. I mean, I had a lot of tickets in my pocket, but I could line the wall up with all of my accomplishments in life. You could see my entire record. And one day this, this guy comes in and he says, I'm going to conduct a search. And I thought this guy was breaking the law, coming into my factory, telling me he was going to search. I said, do you have a warrant? I didn't know anything about law, but I always knew you had to have a warrant if you're going to search. And this guy looked at me like I was stupid. <laughs> he said, I don't need a warrant to conduct a routine search. I said, well, you do here. And he, he got kind of uppity, and he argued a little bit with me, and as his voice raised a little bit, uh, my voice raised a little bit, and he raised his voice again. He wasn't very big, so I just grabbed him and threw him out in the street. Boy, was he upset. <laughs> and the whole OSHA department got upset. And they had the police down there. I mean, they really come unglued. They sat out on the street. And I didn't understand why this guy came in here, tried to commit an illegal act. I caught a criminal in the act, threw him out in the street. 
How'd you feel if you were the bank vice president, a guy comes in to rob the bank, you grab him, you throw him out in the street, and he goes down and calls the cops, and the police come down and charge you with assault and battery because you roughed up this bank robber? Wouldn't you feel kind of bad? That's the way I felt. I said, what in the hell's going on here? So I, I made a determination that day. I said, something's wrong here. I don't know what it is. Something's wrong. I called my attorney. <laughs> I called my guardian. I said, what's the problem here? And he said, well, you can't use physical violence against a public official. The guy didn't have a warrant. Well, he said, you see, you don't understand the law. My, my attorney was very patronizing that way. He says, well, you see, you just don't understand the law. I guess I didn't. But if I didn't understand my right to a warrant or his necessity for a warrant, then what in the hell was the purpose for having a constitutional right if I didn't understand it and didn't know how to use it? Doesn't that strike you as being kind of preposterous? Right. So if we're going to have a Bill of Rights, if we're going to have laws, rules, and regulations, doesn't your common sense tell you that we have to know how it works and what the limitations are? What are my limitations? And what are your limitations? And when this fire inspector or OSHA inspector or government officer or policeman approaches me and in involves me in conversation, shouldn't I know what his limitations are? Shouldn't he know what his limitations are? Shouldn't I know what my responsibilities are? And shouldn't he know what my responsibilities are? But you know, over the years, my experience has showed me that the policemen don't know what their limits are and they don't know what their responsibilities are, and the average guy on the street doesn't know what his capacities and incapacities are. And that's what causes civil rights litigation, because then the policeman gets a little uppity. You know, you ask him, what's your probable cause for making this stop over here? And he just comes unglued, throws you out of the automobile, kicks you in the ribs twice, and tightens the cuffs up and throws you in the back of the cruiser and hauls you off to jail. That's because he has an MP mentality. He's been in the Army under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, and every time some drunken soldier or sailor asks him some stupid question, that's the way he dealt with that fellow. And so he deals with you out on the street the same way that he dealt with military personnel in the service. He doesn't know that you have a Bill of Rights. He doesn't know what his limitations are. But when you sign that driver's license, you limited your Bill of Rights to a substantial degree, not all of them. You haven't eliminated them, but you have impaired them to a degree. Do you know how far you've impaired your Bill of Rights? Do you know whether or not you need to breathe into the balloon, or whether or not you need to take a urine test, or walk the white line? Do you know what your limitations are and what your responsibilities are? And here's where the problem in law enforcement comes in. The police and the citizens don't know what their limitations are. So let's take a break right here and we'll come back and we'll take a look at what some of these limitations are and why it is that the police overstep their boundaries and when they do, what do you do about it? Is there a solution? Ten minutes. Three, two, one, are we on? All right, we're on. Now, in this next section over here, <clears throat> I want to give you some basis for this concept of law that we talked about in the first hour. First hour I came along, I said, let me show you where law comes from. Now, in the second hour, I want to show you what the basis of this is when you want to use it in a practical application, such as in civil rights litigation. I've argued civil rights over the last 13 years a number of times. Once I collected in gold. I have two civil rights cases going now. I sued a county for a million and a half dollars and I'm going to file another suit probably in the next 30 days for a two and a half million dollar settlement. In other words, two and a half million dollar suit. That's not what we're going to settle for. Because in civil rights litigation, our objective here is to create political change within the community. It isn't necessarily to collect money, although that's a neat fringe benefit that comes from it. But government is a corporation, and a corporation is a person in the eyes of the law. And both the civil and the common law make provision for me, if I'm injured by a governmental entity over here, to collect a damage. Damages do not have to be necessarily monetary. They could also be a restraining order, an injunction, 
It could be some other form of compensation. It could be a change in, uh, in uh, police practice or routine. So let me give you a little story about what we did up in Idaho. In Boise, Idaho is the county seat of, the, of Ada County, which has the highest population, about 160,000 people. In 1983, they had $35 million worth of lawsuits brought against them. It put them about 100% higher than the national average. There are 3,500 counties in the United States, and all of those counties carry liability insurance. In other words, Mutual of Omaha indemnifies the victims of counties and the other municipal workers of the county when there's a damage done. So let's suppose that a county dump truck runs into your car. Well, the county has insurance. Let's suppose that a policeman causes you a damage by beating you up. He got his adrenaline flowing. Well, the county has insurance, and the county will pay for those damages. If you're in jail and you get sick, they'll send you to the hospital, and the county or its insurance carrier will pay the hospital bill. This is provided for under Title 40. Section 1983 of the Civil Rights Act of 1871. It was an act first passed in 1868 for the benefit of the newly freed slaves, the blacks in the rural South. There had to be a methodology for those people to obtain a remedy from counties and other municipal corporations in the South in the, in the event that they suffered a damage. Now, that law sat on the books with less than 100 cases per year litigated under that section of the law until 1961, when the blacks, during the civil rights years of the 1960s, began to use Title 42, Section 1983. As they began to use it until today, 1990, it's used approximately 30,000 times a year. Now get this, in 1955, there were 100 cases filed. But in 1985, the last year that I have any uh, direct numbers, there were 26,800 cases filed. And every year, it grows by 1,000 to 2,000 cases a year. In other words, there are more and more people now finding that there was a remedy enacted by Congress in 1868, codified in 1871, which has been added to, such as the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which now protects women in employment and minorities and, and such other things as that. And until today, you have a very viable vehicle for gaining redress of grievance whether you're a denizen or a citizen, whether you're a citizen or an alien against municipal corporations in the United States. Now, over the last 13 years that I've been teaching Title 42, now I've collected one settlement. This is not my business in life to run out here suing and getting settlements because this case that I did took six years. And then since 1985, I have 15 students who have sued successfully under this act and collected their damages. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories here so that you can see the relevance that fits in with it. This is one of the classes that I teach in my civil rights class at Isabella, Missouri. Now, for many of you, you may say, well, I don't want to sue the city of Denver or any municipal corporation or policeman. But someday you may want to. And if you ever want to, there are four key rules that you have to get over. It's Rule 7A, 8A2, 12B6, and Rule 56 in order for you to succeed. Now, I had breakfast this morning with a lady that said that she'd sued I'll write them down for you, ma'am. It's Rule 7A, 8A2, 12B6, and Rule 56. Now, I had breakfast this morning with the lady, and she mentioned that she had sued Pro Se, and that she had forced the company that she worked for to settle with her out of court for a small amount of money and give her a letter of recommendation. 
Had she known how to use the Civil Rights Act, she probably could have settled for $50,000 and still gotten the same letter of recommendation had she known how to present this action. <clears throat> Whether or not you use the action, the mere fact that you know how to project your knowledge of the use of the action will oftentimes intimidate public officials into giving you the remedy that you want. For instance, when I go into my county recorder's office, or I want to talk to Billy Hamilton in the clerk's office, where I live in my local area, since I have brought a number of these suits in the past, they all know that if I walk in and say, I'm entitled to this and I want you to give it to me, if you don't give it to me, do you know what I'm going to do next, Mr. Hamilton? Well, Billy knows I'm going to sue him. And if I walk into my county recorder or anybody else in my public, uh, my county courthouse, and I say, I want this from you, I'm always careful never to ask anybody for something I'm not entitled to. But if I tell you, lady, this is what I want, and you don't give it to me, my next question is, what's your name and how do you spell it? Because my remedy comes from the federal district court. So what I'm going to do, no, nothing personal. Court is business, nothing more, nothing less. It's a business forum. It's a business forum that has been created for us and for our benefit to effect a remedy when somebody who is supposed to do something for you refuses or does something to you that he's not supposed to do. Where am I going to get a remedy? If the policeman beats me up and leaves me unconscious alongside the road, who am I going to get to arrest him and charge him with assault? Another policeman? You see how preposterous this is? So the Civil Rights Act, in reality, is the citizen's methodology for riding herd over the bureaucracy. Anytime a public official has a duty to perform and refuses to perform it, and you say to him, you have a duty and I have a right now I'm here to demand my right based upon your duty. Give me what I'm entitled to. When he says, I won't do it, he just broke the law. When a public official breaks the law, what do we do to get the redress of grievance? And the answer is, we sue him under the Civil Rights Act. So let's suppose that you put me in jail. As I pointed out to you yesterday, there's a publication written by the Department of Justice called Federal Standards for Prisons and Jails. Well, I was in the Webster County Jail a couple of months ago and had an opportunity to bring Federal Standards for Prisons and Jails into the jailhouse scenario. One of the first things that I noticed when I walked into the cell block was that there seemed to me to be an excessive number of people for the amount of square footage that was available. So I measured it off, you know, I'm three, six, and all these prisoners are, are looking at me as I looked around the room, counting one, two, three, four, nine, eleven, twelve. And I said, has anybody got a pencil and a piece of paper? And the what do you want it for? Well, I want to find out whether or not this jail is in compliance with standard 12.631 of the Federal Standards for Prisons and Jails. It looks like we're overcrowded in here to me. You know, these guys are all standing around like, huh, who is this klutz anyway? <laughs> well, a guy gave me a piece of paper and I worked it out and there, there seemed to be 26.82 square feet per prisoner. And I said, my God, uh, how many of you people in here have been sentenced? I said, are you sentenced here? Oh, no, I'm waiting trial. Are you sentenced here? And so on around the room. I found that five people had been sentenced and were serving their terms, and seven people, like myself, were called detainees. So I noted that down over here, and I said, how long has this been going on? How long have you been here? You, you, you. I said, my God, there's crime going on right in front of your nose. <laughs> and I noted that down. 
Do you know that every prisoner must have 96 square feet? Now, it can be in solitary confinement, 9 by 12, or it can be in a cell block in which you have 5 or 10 prisoners. But everybody has to have a minimum amount of space. It's the law. Now, it's true that most of these jails are overcrowded. And it's true that not very many suits are filed subject to overcrowding. But I'd like to point out that the entire penal system of Texas is being administered today by a federal judge. How many of you knew that? And the issue was overcrowding. So if you find yourself in a jail cell with less than 96 square feet, then we're overcrowded. Now, we have to do something to alleviate the overcrowding. Now, what do you do? Kick on the wall? No, all that's going to do is break your toes because the walls are concrete. I've tested them. <laughs> uh, let me tell you. Uh, what are you going to do? Shake the bars? Well, they won't open because I already tested those too, and you're not going to open them. So I said to this one fellow, I said, do you have a pencil and paper that that you could give me to write an administrative demand. Now there's a couple, three guys standing around. They said, what's that? I said, somebody needs to tell the sheriff that there's overcrowding going on. Somebody needs to tell the authorities that there's a crime going on here. Maybe they don't know. I don't know whether the sheriff knows there's a crime going on here or not. I need to tell him. And this is the first element in legal process. It's called administrative due process. So the first thing I have to do is write an administrative demand to the sheriff and tell him about a crime that's going on. And I should, if it's at all possible, tell him where that crime has been codified, whether it's in Title 12 <coughs> of the state code. Now in California, well, in Idaho, I think it's Title 19. In California, I think it's Title 12. <clears throat> your state, Colorado, has a title in your revised statute concerning jails and prisons. And your state prescribes how many square feet there should be for a prisoner in that jail. And the federal government does this also through federal standards of prisons and jails. Now, you tell the jailer by simply writing the sheriff an administrative demand which says, Dear Sheriff, let me inform you that my name is George Gordon. I'm incarcerated in the Webster County Jail. I've been here since 9 o'clock this morning, and it's now 9.30, and I've discovered a crime going on in your jail and I want to report it. There are 12 prisoners in the cell block, <coughs> which works out to 26.82 square feet per prisoner. This is a violation of federal standards for prisons and jails section 12.614 or whatever it happens to be, will you please correct this deficiency as soon as possible? Thank you, George Gordon. And I just peeled it off and I put it in the bars and the first time a jailer came through I said, hi, hey, 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 wait a minute, I want to report a crime. Here it is. Now I've had people tell me, uh, the jailer said, take it and stuff it where there's no daylight. And he just walks off. Now what do you do? No, then I just thump it right on off onto the floor. Because when it comes to serving process, all I have to do is serve the process. What you do with the process after I've served it is irrelevant to me. But I need his name. And all these guys have a little tag right here. So the second element to good civil rights litigation is called the log. So I keep a log book. So I said, hey, I need some more paper over here. Did you see that, <clears throat> that bill, John? I tried to serve process on him. Did you see that? What's your name? You're a witness. <laughs> Did you see that? That's a witness. So I keep a jail log in which I keep track of everything that goes on in that jail. When a jailer comes in, I note the time. I note his name. And I note what he did while he was there. He took prisoner Johnson down for arraignment. When Johnson comes back, I debrief Johnson and I write it in my notes. 
It doesn't take very long until the prison officials find out what I'm doing because there will always be a trustee who will go to the jail, the sheriff, or to a jailer and tell them what I'm doing. Then the sheriff came up and he said, what's going on here? I said, going on? What does that mean? What are you doing? Well, I'm keeping a log. What are you keeping it for? I'm keeping track of all of the criminal activity that's going on inside the jail. And I'm reporting every criminal violation to you. I reported one to you at 9.32 this morning to Officer Bill John. And he said, you, you what? I said, yeah. I gave him an administrative demand. I think you're standing on it. Huh? What? What? See? Just blows them away. Why are you doing that? Because I'm a civil rights investigator. And I'm here in your jail investigating all of the rights violations that are going on. And as long as I'm here, I'm going to keep this log and I'm going to inform you by administrative demand, which is my legal requirement. Every time I find a violation, I'm going to tell you, Sheriff, and then I want you to correct that violation because I have a right <clears throat> to due process and equal protection under the law, and I want you to give it to me. <coughs> well, he got a little upset and he kind of stormed out, but I wrote 29 administrative demands. In the process, I found 29 crimes. Even if you could convict me of driving without a license, you still have the small problem of you still got one charge against me and I got 29 against you. So I filed suit. I said, well, each one of these violations is worth $25,000 plus $25,000 in punitive damages since there's about 30 of them, that's about a million and a half dollars. And so that's the price tag I put on. Now you need to be careful that you don't put a price tag on that's outside the scope of the law. In other words, what is a civil rights violation worth in monetary damages? So you go to the literature and you find where other cases have been decided and what was the award in those cases. What did they sue for, and what did they settle for? See how simple that is? Now this is the paperwork that goes with it. <clears throat> and as I pointed out, I have some students who have collected damages. Let me tell you about one young fellow. <clears throat> he was in Oklahoma City driving his car down the road. Didn't have a driver's license. Well, the police stopped him for some reason, and when they found out he didn't have a driver's license, they arrested him and put him in jail. But in the process of the arrest, they beat him up. But wait a minute, that's police brutality. It's true that the policeman has a duty to arrest people without a driver's license. But it is not true that he has the power to beat you up in the process. That's against the law. So the man sued for $500,000 or something on that order. And then when it came time to negotiate the settlement, which now this is key because there shall be a complaint and an answer, <clears throat> and your complaint must state a claim, <clears throat> and 12b-6, a claim which has as its object relief, and 56 on summary judgment that must state a claim as a matter of law. He had done all of that. <clears throat> he succeeded in staying in the game through these four roadblocks and settled the case out of court. He spent three days in jail, took a little beating, and he settled for around $12,000. Walked away. But now today in Oklahoma City, this man reports to me that he drives all around without his driver's license and nobody bothers him. Now, the police have gone a little bit too far. <clears throat> Perhaps they should stop him and perhaps they should arrest him for no driver's license. But you see what's happened here. Because he sued them and collected once, the insurance company comes along and tells the chief of police, we're going to double your premiums if you keep messing with this guy. We don't want to hear of this again. Now, I learned of this technique from Judge Russell Clark. He's the federal district judge over in Springfield. He pointed out to me one time, he said, you know, you can never count on local political officials 
making any meaningful change in regards to civil rights because the local officials are never responsible for their actions because they're all insured. When the policeman beats you up, there's no way you can get to the policeman because he has a $100,000 bond. So it doesn't make any difference to him as a matter of practical fact whether you sue him or not because it doesn't cost him anything. But let me tell you where the action really lies. When you sue them for a million dollars, it puts the insurance company at risk for a million dollars. So as a matter of law, they have to take one-fifth, 200000 and put it in an impound account as a contingency against the legal loss. No insurance company wants to take $200,000 and put it in limbo while some jerk is suing over something as trivial as a false arrest. So the next step in the scenario is <clears throat> while the insurance company is at risk the whole million dollars, that is, every time I keep this case in litigation, it brings them one step closer to an adjudication. I'm asking for a million dollars. While it's true that practically never do any litigants collect the full one million, they're always at that potential risk, aren't they? And what's this issue all about? One little false arrest. Maybe it's worth eight or ten thousand dollars. In addition, we had to put two hundred thousand dollars over here in an impound account and watch what George Gordon does because there's 830 rules. There's actually only 83 rules, but they run from A to J. <clears throat> so there's about 830. And every time I'm entitled to something, I write a motion. And I say, I want a motion for this or a motion for that. And every time I do that, the insurance company's attorney has to write a motion in opposition or in an answer. And it takes him an hour. It, only, it doesn't make any difference if it only takes him 90 seconds. He's going to bill them for an hour. And then he gets $150 an hour. So I know that every time I write a piece of paper, it costs my opponent, Mutual of Omaha, 150 bucks. Furthermore, I know that when this case goes to trial, it's going to cost him $12,000. So it's going to cost him $12,000 to try the case, plus $150 a motion. Do you think the insurance company's law firm, Quain Smith, Howard & Hull, wants to settle this case as soon as possible? <laughs> or do they want to drag this case out for as long as possible? How soon do you think I want to close the case? <laughs> no, I don't want to close the case at all. I want to work with Quain Smith, Howard & Hull to drag this case out for six years so that I can run the cost. Did you hear what? Mullins had to say, Eustace Mullins, he said they were trying to collect $15 and they spent $22,000. Did you get that? Yeah. All right. How many times do you think they're going to try to collect $15 from Mr. Mullins in that town? <laughs> you see, this is the message that Judge Clark sent me. He said the insurance company won't sit still for it. It's the insurance underwriter or the claims adjuster who comes down to Ozark County, walks into the mayor's office, walks into the county commissioners, walks into the sheriff or the chief of police and says, let me tell you how this is going to come down. The reason I know how effective this is is because in Ada County, Idaho, the chief of police up there was fired over our activity. A new chief of police named Jim Montgomery from... Uh, what is this, Lewistown or Louis, Louistown or what do they call that? Lewiston? No, it's in Kentucky. What's that town where they have the Kentucky Derby? Louisville. Louisville. Only they don't call it Louisville, they call it Louisville. Louisville. There you go, Louisville. <laughs> anyway, he came up there and <clears throat> we had a talk with him one time. And he said, well, we don't agree with your political activity. Uh, the cost and the pressure that we're receiving from the insurance underwriters is so great that we're going to eliminate 10 of you or we're going to put 10 of you on a list 
and you're one of them, Mr. Gordon, and we're not going to arrest you anymore. Now, that's how important that becomes to you when you learn civil rights litigation. Now, I'm not sitting here saying that I want everybody out here to start bringing actions against the city so that we can destroy law and order. That's not the objective. The objective here, though, is that there are approximately 40,000 law enforcement agencies in the United States. Of those 40,000, the Supreme Court estimated that every one of them commits one civil rights violation every day. Now, in Los Angeles County, they kill 16 people on average per year in the Los Angeles City Jail. They kill 16 a year on average. Dead. Dead. Got that? Kill. Murder. Destroy. Terminate. So does New York, Chicago, Kansas City, St. Louis, every major metropolitan jail kills a certain number of people. It's against the law to take a prisoner into jail and kill him. It doesn't make any difference how he dies in there. If the guy just got cold feet, developed pneumonia and died in jail, he's in custody, it's wrongful death. It's the end of the argument. Now, every one of those has a potential liability, but not everybody knows how to sue. And the trick is in pro se litigation, because let me tell you how the litigation system works. I once had, well, I've so far kept track of 18 farmers who have come down to class and 18 of them had filed under Chapter 11 for protection in the bankruptcy code. And one of them told me the story. We always knew how it worked, but we didn't have proof until this one farmer came down. He said, here's what happened to me. In a year and a half, he'd hired an attorney. And in a year and a half, they'd filed a lot of motions. And this attorney would come in, and he'd get a postponement, or he'd win a little technical move. Hey, we socked it to him again. Cost him $18,000. And every time this lawyer would win a technical move, well, this farmer was pretty impressed, wasn't he? By God, I've got a lawyer that's out here really working for me. And this lawyer really had done a hell of a job. In other words, this is a $3.5 million foreclosure, and for only $18,000 over a period of 18 months, and they got postponements, and they got all kinds of discovery, and they got all kinds of rules. Uh, <coughs> Uh, issues that they were entitled to. But all of a sudden, one day, they walked in to a hearing, and the judge forced him into Chapter 7, liquidation, and it was all over. And the lawyer came out, and he says, God, I can't believe that that dirty judge would do that. But we gave him a hell of a fight. But we finally lost the war. Well, two years before, this fellow's brother-in-law had been foreclosed on by the same bank two miles down the road. It was a house and a small amount of acres, I don't know, 10, 20 acres, and a house. Uh, well, all of a sudden, he saw this lawyer down the road. Now he's his neighbor. See, this lawyer's down the road living in his brother-in-law's house. Now, this house had been empty for a couple of years, and the farmer started to ask himself, well, gee, uh, I wonder why my attorney, Sam, is now living in my brother-in-law Joe's house, which was foreclosed on by the bank. So I went down to the county recorder, and they found out that the attorney had bought the house from the bank for $500. What's that tell you? Now, if you had a $3.5 million foreclosure, and some guy had filed for protection under the Bankruptcy Act, and if this guy was successful, <clears throat> you couldn't foreclose on the three and a half million. Wouldn't you want to talk to this guy's guardian and see if you could make a deal with the guardian? Because here's what the issue was over. <clears throat> when you file for bankruptcy, you have to file what's called a plan, a reorganization plan. Simply a part of the rules. Without the plan, you're going to be forced into Chapter 7 liquidation. And that's what happened to all 18 of these farmers that have come in. And every one of their attorneys told them, your creditors wouldn't accept the reorganization plan. Excuse me, what's the purpose for Chapter 11? It's to force the creditors into reorganization against their will and over their objection by judicial decree. So when your attorney says to you, gee, I talked to your creditors and they wouldn't accept a reorganization plan, 
that tells you that something's screwy to begin with. And none of the 18 filed the necessary plan. So the judge simply comes back and says, no plan? Liquidate. So they force this guy into liquidation. <coughs> if you were trying to collect three and a half million dollars, wouldn't you pay fifty or a hundred thousand dollars to your opponent's lawyer to accomplish your goal? See how simple that is? Goes on all the time. There's nothing illegal about this. If you could prove that there was collusion or that there was uh, uh, interplay of some kind, you could sue your attorney for malpractice. But how are you ever going to prove such a flimsy case? Because you see, it's all done above board. The lawyer walked into the bank, said, hey, you got that piece of property over there. You've had it for two years. There's nothing you can do with it. I'll take it off your hands for 500 bucks. And the bank says, yeah, it was, a, <clears throat> it was a bad piece of property. We couldn't sell it. We tried to sell it. Finally, we just gave it to this lawyer because he wanted it for 500 bucks. <laughs> and what are you going to prove? Now, remember, your attorney <clears throat> is a member of an exclusive club of 635,000 bar members. These people all belong to an exclusive union. And you cannot get an attorney to sue another attorney because it's a violation of the ethics of the brotherhood. So if you said, my attorney is guilty of malpractice and you went out and hired an attorney, your attorney would take your money and sue that attorney. And he'll jump up and down and rant and rave and paw the ground and bite the bushes and lose. Because that's the way the brotherhood works. Now, if you go in there pro se and sue an attorney, <coughs> they can't throw you out of the bar association. You can't be disbarred, and you can't be punished for claiming a right. I could sue an attorney for malpractice. But how would I sue an attorney for malpractice when I wouldn't hire an attorney because I work pro se? So I'm never going to come up against that because it's a physical impossibility. So they're never going to get it from a pro se, and you could never get another attorney to prosecute another attorney because he'd be disbarred in short order. Let me tell you another story. I had a lady up in Ketchikan, Alaska. She had been arrested on a parking ticket. Now Ketchikan's a unique place because there's only 27 miles of road on this island. and I don't think they've got more than 25 or 30 parking meters in town. It's not a very big town. I doubt if there's 10,000 people there. They don't need parking meters, but for some reason they have a few, probably down on the wharf. Anyway, this lady parked down there, and then some policeman got a little antsy, and he arrested her and put her in jail. Well, come to find out, under the Alaska statutes, a parking meter violation is not an arrestable offense, so we've got false arrest and false imprisonment. So she sued under the Civil Rights Act, and she settled the case for $8,000 out of court. She spent a couple of days in jail, which is about par for the course, and she settled for the $8,000, went down to City Hall, and took the check. Well, it's a well-known fact that this lady doesn't have a driver's license, and so when she walked out of the, of the uh, City Hall with the $8,000 check she got in her pickup, she's a fisher lady, she, she catches salmon, she has a boat. <clears throat> she uh, gets in her pickup and she drives down to probably the only street light on the island <laughs> and the police surrounded her and arrested her for driving without a license and hauled her back to jail. Well, this lady had just been through my civil rights class about 30 days before. And during the class, of course, we talk about some of these live, on-site opportunities that arise. Well, it happens that there's a law that requires when a woman is arrested that she be attended to by a matron. Now, it isn't true with you men. If you've got three women deputies who are going to attend you, that's not a violation of your rights. But if you're arrested, you can't have three male deputies attend to you. You have to have a matron. Well, in many of these small counties, like my county, for instance, they don't have any separate facilities for women. And they don't have matrons or dietitians. you know, these things that you have in Los Angeles and St. Louis. You just don't have in Ketchikan, Alaska. 
Well, they brought her in, and now the first thing they want to do is book you in, and they want you to put on the jail clothes. So they took this lady into a room, and they said, here's the jail clothes, put these on. And these two deputies walked out. Well, when they came back a few minutes later, she still hadn't put the clothes on. Well, now the deputy's duty is to get this woman dressed in her jail clothes so they can lock her up. And she's not dressed in her jail clothes. And she said, I'm not going to put these clothes on. Well, these two officers over here tried to cajole her and tried to rattle her and threaten her and one thing and another. And pretty soon, one of them comes over and he grabs her by the arm and she screams, no, no, don't rape me, and rips her blouse open and tears her bra off, crawls on the floor to the door to the booking area, stumbles out into the booking area in full view of five or six other deputies. Don't let them touch me again. They're trying to rape me. Now about this time, these two guys look around. What's going on? How would you like to defend that? So they settled that one for 12000 out of court. Now, <coughs> this lady is no longer accosted for driving without a license in Ketchikan, Alaska. Can you understand why? <laughs> the maximum fine for driving without a li license is 50 bucks. And it costs the insurance company $12,000. Don't you suppose that somebody from Mutual of Omaha walked into the chief of police and said, come over here and sit down and let me explain this to you. <laughs> suppose that's the way that came down? That's the way it works and that's the way Judge Clark explained it to me. And that's the way <clears throat> the chief of police up in Boise explained it to me. See the pressure that's brought to bear. It comes from the insurance company. It doesn't come from the, the chief of police because he loves the Constitution and he respects your rights. That is never going to happen. It's a matter of, and as I've pointed this out, as a matter of law. The law isn't blind. You know, we went to school and they taught us this symbol, justice is blind. <clears throat> and the law is equally applied to everyone. See how that works? Now, if you believe that, I have here this watch. <laughs> and for only $19.95, I will give you this 100 carat gold watch. <laughs> now, obviously, there's some middle ground here that has some reason, logic, and common sense. Law and the judicial system is a business forum. If you wanted to settle an insurance claim, and then you walked into the insurance company, and you go into the personnel department, and you, I'm going to settle this claim. You owe me $100,000. What do you think personnel is going to say to you? I'm terribly sorry. You're in the wrong room. You need to go to the claims department. It's out here in the corridor to the left, third door on the right. And you say, I'm not going to claim. And if you don't settle this claim today, I'm going to sue you. What do you think your chances of winning the suit or of getting your claim settled? And this is the kind of insanity that goes on under the guise of pro se litigation and at law actions and patriot litigation. The judicial system is a business forum, just like the insurance company. If you walk in there and you keep your head on straight, if you get into the wrong room and you ask politely, they'll say, oh, I'm terribly sorry, you're in the wrong room, this is personnel. If you'll go to claims, third door on the left, I uh, think they can take care of you. Now, you go down to claims and you say, Hi, my name is George Gordon. I have a policy with your company. I have a claim and I'd like to file it. Somebody will pull out a piece of paper and they'll say, Here, fill this form out and uh, let's see if we can process your claim. And if you do all of the things that you're supposed to do at some point in time, if your claim is reasonable and if your claim is approved, you'll get a check. And the same thing is true with the judicial system. If you can walk in and file a complaint, which is a claim, and you can follow these 830 rules, which is the rule book for collecting the claim, if in fact your claim has merit and you're entitled to the benefits that are guaranteed under the terms of the contract, at some point in time you will walk out with the check. Now, I don't take checks. I take gold. So when I negotiate a settlement, I want it done in Krugerrand 
And that can be accomplished also. Most people, though, will simply take a check or a warrant from the insurance company. I don't. I want to be paid in gold. And I force the companies, there's three companies, to pay me in gold so it can be done that way also. Now, this class costs two and a half ounces of gold. We have 15 successful claims, 15 successful suits. I don't know how many of my students have filed claims and failed, because typically people don't report failures. Furthermore, most people don't report their successes either. In other words, people who go through my civil rights class never call me back and tell me, well, I filed a claim and I won, and here was, here's the proceeds that came from it. All I can tell you is that we've probably put 100 people through the class, maybe 200. I'm not really sure. I haven't really kept that close a track, but I'd say at least 100. And 15% of them, or 15, have reported back and said, here's been my experience and here was my success. Everybody who is accosted in the United States, and one of the first lessons we start off on is this Chicago strip search case. How many of you read about the Chicago strip search? Well, between 1959 and 79, Cook County had a policy of strip searching women, arresting them, then strip searching them, and jailing them over anything, tail lights out, no driver's license, registration's expired, or whatever it happened to be. Well, come to find out, that's unconstitutional. It's a criminal act for which one federal judge made this observation in 1986. He said there are still a potential 272,000 claims on that particular policy of and by itself. If every one of those women were to sue under the Civil Rights Act, they would bankrupt Cook County in the same way that the asbestos problem with Johns Manville bankrupted them. I want to read to you a little section here. I think it's, uh, yeah, the $112,000 award to a 38-year-old doctor who was strip searched by Chicago police in January of 78 is the largest of 11 verdicts that arose from a 1979 class action against the city with 25 more cases still to be tried in federal court. I, th I would say it need not be reiterated that this policy is no longer in force in Cook County. Now, it was for 20 years, and they had arrested 500,000 women in that 20-year period, of which 272,000 of them were still viable actions. So in the early days of the policy, they weren't arresting very many people but within six years of 1979, that is between 1973 and 79, they'd arrested 272,000 women. Now, if each one of those sued for $1 million, the insurance company would be upside down overnight, just putting up the 20% deposit. Secondly, not only would it change the policy in the city, it would also double or cancel their insurance. For instance, in Boise City, here's what we did. First of all, $35 million in suits put them at double the national average. The insurance underwriter went to them and talked to them and then finally canceled their insurance. Then the next company doubled their premiums, carried them for one year, and they canceled their policy, which brought in a third company, which doubled their premiums again. And this all occurred in 1983, 84, and into 1985. Within, in less than 36 months, we had quadrupled the insurance premiums. Can you see why the chief of police said, Mr. Gordon, while we don't agree with your political objectives, we're not going to arrest you anymore? 